say the meeting will take 90 to 100 minutes. Well, we're already eating into that time, so I think it'll go a bit longer, longer than that. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, so to our speaker, uh, Dr. Scott Wilson is a senior research fellow at Macquarie University's Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences and director of the Litter Lab. He has over 20 years of research experience in ecotoxicology, ecological assessments and water quality monitoring. He has been prominent in the development and use of bioindicators and sensors for the assessment of tropical and temperate waters. Dr. Wilson is also currently the research director of the Australian Microplastic Assessment Project. That's OSMAP, you may well have heard of that, uh, going around the traps. A nationwide citizen science project identifying microplastic hotspots and working with stakeholders on source reduction. He is also assessing the biological impacts of marine debris and microplastic to aquatic biota and determining the source, sink and patterns of movement of litter and debris through a catchment and nearby near shore environments. Uh, with that um, uh, resume uh, of Scott, please welcome Scott. To the Thanks for that introduction, Kim. Yeah. All right, yeah. Um, I can see the people. Hello, everyone out there. Uh, and all good. Yeah. Just uh, let me know if you can't hear me. Those people online. Uh, I should also say. Speaking into the background. No worries. Thanks, Kim. Uh, I should say I'm also had a recent <coughs> change in position. So I'm also, if you see up on on the screen there, I'm also the chief scientist at the Earthwatch Institute, which is a new job I've just taken on in the last uh, couple of weeks or months, should I say. Yeah, so what I'm going to talk to you about today uh, is some work that I've been doing around the country and also um, different parts of the world around the issues of plastics. I'm, I'm sure you're all aware of plastics and the issues of, of it, but I'm going to hone in on, on one aspect and particular projects which uh, you can get involved with here in, in your local area. So let's jump into it. So <clears throat> obviously plastics, we know um, we have a, very much a, a love affair with, with them. Uh, we live in a disposable society these days. Everywhere you go, there's things wrapped in plastic. Um, <clears throat> you go to the supermarkets and you'll see images like this, hopefully not as much these days, but it is very much obviously a trend where you've got you know, shells of your fruit and veg wrapped in plastic. Um, some extreme cases where you've got lemons wrapped, of course. Um, and the top in the middle there is an onion. Uh, in the top left is a pre-peeled mandarin in a plastic container because obviously we can't peel things these days uh, and my favorite which is actually not from Australia but from from Italy yes is a banana uh, once again pre-peeled but on a foam tray with plastic wrap over the top um, so who knows what the logic is around that but because we've just got so much plastics you know some of it gets recycled as you're aware a lot of it ends up in landfill but a certain proportion you know just ends up being littered or blowing into the environment or being disposed into the environment so there's just through the sheer volumes of plastics we're using there's an element that ends up in the environment And this graphic is just illustrating the, the production of plastic. So if we think about how long plastics have been around as a commercial product, it's been since the 1950s uh, and it's ramped up. So this, this line here, I've got a point up, so I don't need to wander off. This line here, yeah, you can see the line, <laughs> um, is where, 
is the red bit is where we're up to about now of the line. So we're producing, this is on a global trend, about 330, 340 million tonnes of plastic each year. Okay, that is being produced. The rest of the graph, <coughs> excuse me, is the predicted rate of growth in plastics to 2050. So in the next 20 to 30 years, you can see it just ramping up. Uh, and so you think if you think plastic is rife now, then you know it's only going to get worse unless we do something about it. And I'll talk a bit about towards the end of the, the talk about what we can do. Excuse me. <clears throat> so plastics are everywhere. And plastic, I'm, I'm not bashing plastics because plastics are obviously ben very beneficial for how we live, how we survive. You know, a lot of the medical treatments and why we can, you know, fly across the world and drive our cars economically, you know, is, is due a lot to plastics. But it's, it's about being mindful about the types of plastic and that previous image with, um, you know, the supermarket is a, is a case in point where we just need to be using the right types of plastic in the right places. <clears throat> so here's a photo of an image close to here in the Cooks River, uh, but we could probably go to places in the Georges River as well and, and see similar uh, issues. What we know is pretty much where people live, in cities and towns, you get rubbish accumulating. And our waterways, our river systems, our creeks are the conduits for that rubbish from the land to our oceans. So we know around the globe, there's about 80% of what we see floating in our oceans is due to land based activities, so what we do on land. And you, know, you can see in this image here, <clears throat> uh, you know, some big items, cups and trays and various things, straws possibly. Um, <clears throat> but what we're concerned of, concerned about is, and this might not show up too well on this image, I hope hopefully we can see that a bit clearer. What we're concerned about is it once it's getting into the waterways, it's it's basically diffusing around the whole of the planet. And the blue dots there is really say showing you uh, where it's accumulating. And you may have heard about the, the great Pacific garbage patch. Has anyone heard of that? Some of you have, yeah. So that's in the North Pacific, is this famous patch of floating mass of rubbish that's kind of to give you some Australian context the size of Queensland uh, floating in in the North Pacific and if, my, if the pointer was working which it's not <laughs> All right. uh, that's it now it's working for people at home always point the laser out <laughs> uh, so to the North Pacific garbage patches is, is here. But what we have what we know now by just traversing our world's oceans and going to those middle parts of the oceans, we're finding garbage patches in all our major oceans. And so closer to, to home, we've got in the South Pacific, a garbage patch, it's more to the South American side than on the Australian side, but on the Indian Ocean, we're very much influenced um, on our west coast by, by rubbish. And so because of the, these large, and what's creating these is these large ocean, what they're called gyres, these large ocean currents, and they kind of almost like a centrifugal force. So it's all kind of accumulating towards the middle of that. Less so in the Indian Ocean, uh, but a lot of this rubbish that we find on the west coast of Australia is actually from the African continent. Uh, and it was actually a spill of pellets, these little plastic pellets, and I'll talk about in a minute, 
uh, and they, within about uh, three months or so, they were washing up on, on the West Australian coast. Um, and then they can move across into the Bight and, and into um, South Australia and, and Victoria and Tasmania potentially. Why does it speak about Sorry, say again. Um, is it why it's lower on the east side? Um, is that what you're asking? Sorry, I just can't hear. Well, uh, yeah, yeah. So it's it's you're right. It's kind of the the current. It's the nature of the current. So the question for people at home was why is it mostly appearing on on the eastern sides of the oceans? Um, sorry, on the western sides of the oceans. Yeah, correct. <laughs> so uh, it's because of the current, the circulation patterns. I don't want to kind of get into it, but it's it's because of that is why it's accumulating more to one side than the other. But so really, it's a global issue. And is super, sorry, is it just superficial or that this plastic penetrate? Uh, that's a good question. So there's at what we know of what's in our oceans is actually more on the bottom uh, than floating on the surface. So these these models are, are actually demonstrating what's on the surface. We but our underwater deep sea submersibles are finding a lot of rubbish on the bottom, and obviously it's harder to sample and quantify that. But um, apparently, it's all through the water column. A lot of it's at the surface, but over time, what happens is it changes. So plus, most plastic floats when it's fresh, uh, but then over time, it either gets waterlogged or actually it gets growth on it. So algae and barnacles and things like that will attach to it because they like to attach to hard surfaces. And that changes the, the buoyancy of it. And so it then drops in the, in the water column and then will eventually sink. So they actually estimate there's more on the sea floors than what's floating. So, uh, which is, of course, a concern wherever we are. So one of the issues is once that stuff's out in the environment, all that big stuff, the bottles, the bags, you know, the wrappers and things like that, what happens is it breaks up. So plastic in the environment will continue to break up over time into what we call microplastics. So microplastics is just a category of plastics, a size class, if you like. It's an arbitrary thing in some ways. Um, but if you think of it as anything less than five millimeters in size, is, is a microplastic. Um, and that it breaks up because of wave action, turbulence, but mostly UV, you know, it makes it brittle and it fragments. So plastic doesn't go away. Every bit of plastic that's ended up in the ocean that hasn't been collected by people is still there today from the 1950s. It has just gotten smaller and smaller until we can't see it. And I've included here the next issue, I believe, will be nanoscale <coughs> plastics. There was a paper just published uh, last week about nanoplastics in human blood uh, and i'll talk about human effects in a minute but uh it continues to just fragment it gets smaller and smaller once it's so small it can penetrate you know cell membranes uh or, you know, through tissues and, and through the body so that's that's the issue um but you know the big stuff there's some other categories but what we're dealing with at OSMAP, the Microplastic Assessment Project, is kind of the larger size fraction. And <clears throat> what you may potentially get involved with is this one to five millimetre range. So it's the larger end of the microplastics, <clears throat> but um, it's still visible by eye if you've got a good eye. Okay. So 
a lot of the plastics, as I say, break up from UV, but sometimes we produce microplastics straight away. So as you probably know, a lot of the clothing these days is synthetic or synthetic blends with cotton and whatever else. <clears throat> Those, like any clothing fibre, shed microfibres off them and they, every time you wash your clothes, there was a study done that showed that per garment, per wash, you, you're losing about uh, 10,000 fibres off that garment. And if it's a, a synthetic garment, then obviously it's all plastic. So it's synthetic then plastic. So every time you wash your clothes, or you may have heard about the microbead issue. So <clears throat> a couple of decades ago, uh, manufacturers of various you know, cleaning products, facial scrubs and body washes and things like that, replaced the natural scrubbing agents with plastic, small plastic beads, because they were cheap uh, and they were still effective at cleaning the surface of your body. Every time you wash your face and or brush your teeth, um, all that plastics, obviously it was maybe on your body, went down into the sink or into the shower. And that water, like your, your washing machine water, goes to your wastewater treatment plant. <clears throat> and that wastewater treatment plant isn't designed to treat the really small micro, it's designed to pick up all the big gross stuff. Uh, and so all these, our wastewater treatment plants are in essence a, a source, a, a direct you know, source for microplastics entering into the river or the ocean or wherever it's discharging. So you have got these lots of microplastics entering at those points and creating issues there. Um, yes, so if you, so the question was, is the plastic caught in, when you dry it, in, in the lint filter? Um, so yes, if you took that, looked at that lint under the, the microscope, you'd see it be made up of microplastics. Just fibers. Most of it's going out the water. So. You have to speak a bit louder. Most of it's going out to the water. Or... Yeah. So, so my, with washing machine wastewater, it goes oh. unless you've got your own mesh over the end and you're collecting that, which most people, most machines don't. Um, well, what's happening is the the manufacturers of washing machines are actually changing. Now, so you will find that there will be filters because there's been pressure you know, from this information to change practices and government, uh, federal government is kind of going to be mandating by 2025 that washing machines will have filters on them. So going forward, that should be a reduced issue. Um, and so they're working on that now, the, the manufacturers. So that would be sent. So what, like you clean your, your dryer filter, you're going to have to clean your washing machine filter as well, regularly going forward. So yeah, so the other, the other couple of microplastic sources, and I mentioned pellets. So when plastics are first made, they're made as little pellets, commonly known as nurdles, you might've heard them. Uh, so they're a couple of millimeters and they're shipped to the manufacturers and they put them through their, their process. So they usually heat molded into whatever they're making, a plastic bottle or a bag. But they, they, so they pour them into the molds, they heat them up and they form the shape and produce their bottle. But they often spill because the process isn't a clean process. So uh, either spill in transport or they spill in the operation. So they're coming from the industry um, and so washing out. So if you find pellets uh, in your catchment on the shoreline, you know somewhere upstream someone's 
making something with plastics. Uh, and so I know in the Georges River, you know, you've got a lot of those kind of industrial areas kind of up around Liverpool, Fairfield area that would drain in uh, and or a bit of Campbelltown um, would drain into the Georges River and down, um, down here. And so that's another potential source. Uh, and then the last source is one that uh, a Kim and Adrian and others have been looking at already is this black stuff here is this black stuff here, which is rubber crumb. So rubber, and you can pass it around for people to have a look at. Rubber, if you didn't know these days, is synthetic. It's not natural rubber from the from the rubber tree anymore. Or, sorry, some of it is, but a lot of it is synthesized in the lab. And so it's in essence a form of plastic these days. And what they've done is so all our tires, our vehicle tires, um, pretty much every rubber product is, is a plastic. And you think about how much tire grit comes off each year um, from that. But what they, and, and so that comes off our roads and washes into our stormwater. But the other issue is now um, they're using a lot of synthetic sports fields and the soil substitutes in that is rubber is old rubber tires that are being crumbed so they're being chewed up mechanically and create products like those you're seeing which have been collected from uh yeah um, just down the road here so this is an issue as well a very much once again a localized issue so there's lots of sources of microplastics, of course, because they're so small, as I mentioned, there's harm to wildlife uh, and potentially the humans. So obviously the big stuff, you probably have seen images of things wrapped in plastic um, or tangled, entangled in plastic is probably a common uh, image you may have seen down the track. This one also you may have seen at some stage or something similar to this. So this is a, a, a seabird, an albatross chick. Uh, so this is the bird it, it had recently died. It was opened up. And all this panel to the right is all the plastic, 363 bits of plastic that they got from this one bird's stomach. So, and you can see there's a range of sizes. So it's not all micro, it's not all small bits. There's toothbrushes and bottle caps and cigarette lighters and things like that. Um, so this, this is a chick. So it's sitting on the nest. It's pet, both the parents in this particular species are feeding at sea and picking up what they think are food and, and then regurgitating it to the chick. So this chick more than likely died from starvation because you know the parents were thinking they were feeding it you know nutritional food um but it was not getting anything and so more more than likely starved to death in this case sometimes they their gut lining gets perforated by the sharp objects but in this case it was uh, more than likely starvation so why why you may ask are the the birds picking up this plastic, and which is an interesting question. Um, I did some work on the Great Barrier Reef with uh, the mutton birds up there, and we found a color selection process in the adults picking it up. So this is uh, an albatross chick, and you can see there's you know, a mixture of colors, but if we looked at the data from the mutton birds, we see there's mostly greens and yellows, which we think are mimicking a bit of the prey color that they would normally um, feed upon. The other thing about plastics is that when they're floating around in the ocean, they actually suck up all the smells and the scents of the chemicals 
And so all the fish oils and things like that would adhere to the surface of these plastics. So we think, we know that some of these seabirds actually feed by scent. So there's some of them are visual cue to pick the food up. And then when they get close, you know the ones you said that dive into the water, they don't use their sight when they're in, under the water, they actually use scent. And so those, those plunge diving birds we think are using the, the smell or what they think is the smell of fish but on plastics to pick it up. So anyway, that's a theory, but it's the current thinking. So we're seeing evidence of this now throughout many species from plankton through to whales, pretty much any aquatic species, both freshwater and marine, evidence of plastic in their bodies. Some are severe examples like that seabird, <clears throat> others are less severe and more chronic level effects. And this image is just showing you that it's not just the plastic. So here's a little plankton here and those little green dots and that green glow, uh, the green is microplastic. And so that's in its, its stomach, if you like, uh, just to show, this is just a lab experiment, just showing that it is accumulating in these plankton. And of course, you know, it moves through the food chain. So we, when we're doing that seabird work up on the reef, we would uh, regurgitate the chicks to get their, their stomach contents. And then we'd often get the whole little fish and we'd open up the little fish and we'd find microplastics in the fish. So sometimes it's secondary or tertiary ingestion that the larger animals are getting the plastic. So it's not direct ingestion in some instances. The other issue with plastics is, like I said, not only do they suck up the oils and the, the, the smells of the sea, but they actually pick up all, all the other pollutants that might be floating in that waterway as well. So the heavy metals, the pesticides, you know, those nasty compounds that are long live <clears throat> will bind to that surface and move once again through the food chain when that is passed on. So those chemical effects is kind of what I've been trying to understand a bit in terms of the impacts of, and I'll show you some data in a minute. Of course, the, the common question is what are the impacts to us? Um, so who eats seafood here? Or has eaten seafood somewhere in their life? Probably a lot of people, um, most people here have. Um, so the question is, well, am I eating plastics when I eat my seafood? Possibly, it depends what you eat. Uh, obviously we eat fillets, mostly, you know, we don't. So most of the plastic is retained in the stomach for those larger pieces um, and doesn't move across the membrane. What I'd say is the chemicals though that are on those plastics may diffuse across though. So, you may be getting a dose of heavy metals uh, above which you would normally get. But if you eat oysters or mussels, or shellfish, you eat the whole animal, don't you? Well, apart from the shell. Uh, and so the stomach and all. So eating shellfish probably exposes you more to microplastics than um, just eating the other seafood. But it's not just seafood. So there's been many studies done around the world and I was involved in a study which you may have heard that we are eating a credit card's worth of plastic every week. Has anyone heard about that study? No? All right, that's all good. So we basic, so there's been lots of studies around the world that have shown that plastics are not just in our seafood, they're actually in a lot of our products we just buy off the shelf. Anything from honey, rice, beer, God forbid. Uh, no one's looked at wine yet, but I reckon we'll get some money to look at that. Um, but a lot of these staple products, just through the production process, uh, and just because they're working in factories and how things get processed. I read a paper that was published in 
tinned uh, tuna. Uh, there was, you know, many thousand bits of microplastics in, in a tin a can of tuna. So we are exposing ourselves every day, potentially to plastics. Um, and in the air we breathe, possibly in this room, we are breathing microplastics. I would hazard a guess to say the chairs you are sitting on are synthetic lined. A lot of our fabrics, our uh, flooring is synthetic. And there's once again, fibers floating, tiny fibers floating around in our air uh, being released to atmosphere and we are breathing it in. So we're breathing it in, we're eating it. It's been shown to be in beverage products and bottled water um, and in pretty much everything, wherever we're looking, we're finding it. Okay, so that's the bad news. <laughs> <laughs> Gonna get any worse? Yeah. Well, actually, so I, there was a study, as I said, that nanoplastics had just been found in, in oh, human right. blood. But anyway, so it's circulating around in our bodies. The evidence, though, of impact, we don't have to humans at this stage. There's potential evidence, and this graphic in the middle of this slide here is related to the chemicals associated with these plastics. So there's phthalates, and phthalates are used as a plasticizer to make the product viable. To, so that you create a bottle, a plastic bottle, you can't just use the normal, the straight plastic. You've got to add chemicals to it to give it that flexibility and, or the durability a bit more. So there's lots of chemi extra chemicals added to it. And unfortunately, it's those chemicals that we know through studies with rats and mice and other surrogate species, which have had a whole range of effects there. So you can see things from you know, digestive, kidney, respiratory, um, nervous system effects, endocrine, hormonal effects. So there's a, a, a slave of studies showing the potential effects of the chemicals. So we need to think about reducing our plastic footprint and how much we expose ourselves to, and just be mindful about where and how we you know, use our products. So one example of that is the rice. As I said, every if you normally buy a bag of rice, a plastic, a plastic bag of rice, if you, there was a study that showed that if you simply wash your rice before you boil it, just under the tap, you know, for 30 seconds or so, you will reduce how much microplastics are in the rice you end up eating quite considerably. There still might be a little bit there, but so it's simple steps like that, which can help. Some things it's hard, harder to do, but I'll, I'll get on to some of the, the good stuff, I suppose. All right. So, and this is kind of where this OSMAP program started on the back of this. So OSMAP, the Australian Microplastic Assessment Project has been going since 2018, mid-2018. Because we just, in Australia, we just didn't know how much was out there. And it's designed as a citizen science program. So it's recruiting the community like yourselves to help us gather the data because you know as a scientist i can't be everywhere around australia collecting data uh, and so what we've done is train people in different places to collect information and tell us where the hot spots are where is it bad where do we need to focus our efforts uh, but it's also about education and raising awareness on issues as well This is a map of Australia, and you probably can't see, but there's different coloured points on there where we've been sampling around the coastline, mostly the coastline, some inland rivers we do as well. Um, we've taken around 400 samples, so it's 400 different communities being involved. Um, 
over the last few years. Uh, and our highest levels we found is, so we always equate the sampling to the amount per meter squared. If you took a meter square of shoreline, the highest levels we found in Australia are 760,000 pieces of microplastic per square meter, which is, I think, extremely high. Uh, it was, in fact, in Adelaide, not in Sydney, down um, near the Adelaide River, uh, near the Port River, sorry, Port Adelaide River. Um, so why was it so bad? It was because there was an industry or a few industries upstream that all those little plastic pellets were washing through the stormwater system and down onto the local shoreline. And, and, and there was an important wetland area. <clears throat> to bring it closer to home here in Sydney, um, We've got samples for lots of places around uh, the coast and, and our rivers, including the Georges River, all the way up to uh, the upper reaches of the Georges River, where it's, so the colors represent how much microplastics per square meter we can't see. The green is less than 10, very low microplastics per square meter all the way up to very high, which are black spots. So in Chipping Norton Lakes uh, is, you know, any kind of lake systems tend to trap a bit more than flowing systems. So uh, that's definitely over a thousand. In the Parramatta River, at the mouth of the Cooks River, these are all extremely high microplastic loads. Um, and so as we come down the George's River, just to concentrate on that, uh, we've got other spots that are, are also high to moderate, uh, probably closer to here, Kyle Bay. Uh, so there's gaps in the data, I suppose, but um, some spots are still low, um, depending on the deposition, is it a depositional area or, or not? So, uh, it's important to document where those are. So not only do we count, but we also look at the types. So is it pellets? Is it fibers? Is it foam? And then the sizes, the colors, the, you know, these are all distinctive features that help us in understanding where it might be coming from. Uh, and so that's an important part of the program, which um, is open for anyone to get involved with. You just have to uh, get into uh, our site and, and contact us. But one area, one particular area, and, and I passed around the, the rubber crumb, we're seeing an increase in our shoreline samples for different plastics are synthetic grass from these sports fields and the rubber crumb. These are, over the last couple of years, a growing amount that we're finding washing up on our shorelines. Because as you may know, a lot of the councils now are, um, well, they've received sports grants from the, the government and those grants have enabled, well, the logic is that let's install a synthetic field, it allows more playing time, uh, you know, over the wet periods, we can play through that. And, but, and that's true to some degree, but um, it also creates other issues. So our synthetic sports fields, but also our playgrounds now, our public playgrounds, most of them, what do you see on the surface? Rubber. That, all these, this is old tires. What they use is shredded up tires to create that surface. Okay, but they come off because they're little crumb, little bits. So our play areas, our sports fields. Um, yeah, so it's so that the 
the idea was we had all these excess tires. So when, when an old tire is, you know, at reached the end of its life, there was nothing, not much to do with it. And so this was seen to be, yeah, the, the saving grace for it, if you like. So they've started shredding them up and putting them into all these sports fields and playgrounds. So it's done locally. Yes. Correct. That's right. And so they're putting it into road base. Um, so there's there's a whole range of options. They used to use them for artificial reefs back in the day, but that was taken away. But if we have a closer look at our sports fields, you'll see that there's the blade, which is obviously a plastic of polyethylene. And then the, the artificial soil is all this rubber crumb. Okay, so it's deliberately crumbed to that a few millimeter size to create a soil like surface. I don't know if anyone's played on it or walked on it, um, but it's uh, very sticky. Uh, it adheres to shoes, to socks. If you're playing, it's mostly used on soccer fields, but other sports are using it as well. Um, it must make it unbelievably hot too, doesn't it? Like, it does. It is. And that's one of the side effects. So the, the playing time in summer is actually very much reduced because the temperatures, We I had some students do some measurements in, this was, June last year or July last year. Uh, so uh, the outside temperature was 22, 23 degrees, the air temperature. Uh, just off the playing surface was 56 degrees. Wow. And that was winter. And so in summer, they, they're regularly recording 70, 80 degrees. And it's, it's almost burning. You can't play on it. In the height of summer. Yeah. So, so the design, so the, the kind of the main part is the, the, the grass blades and the crumb, but then they sit on a block. Um, they might be on concrete or also maybe another rubber pad, but they're kind of designed to collect the water to infiltrate through and that percolates out to a hopefully a storage area. They're all designed slightly differently. <clears throat> but yes, so you're right. There's been a range of effects that have been found with these particular sports fields. Heat effects being one of those. Injury, because they're not as cushioning as a natural surface would be. So there's an increased injury rate. Uh, the chemicals and toxicity of those chemicals. There was a study done, this box to the, to the right is a study done in the US where they found that not only roads, but these sports fields are leaching this really nasty uh, chemical. It's, it's like a, a UV anti-degradant so it's a chemical they put in the tires to stop the tire breaking down under sunlight exposure, but it's still there when you crumb it and put it on a sports field. And they found this chemical, uh, which is called 6-PPD quinone, uh, that was super top. They were finding all their salmon, their coho salmon. This is in Washington state in the West of the US. They're finding all these salmon were dying. Anyway, the, the researchers found that it was really low concentrations of this particular chemical, which was coming from either the roads or the sports fields, depending on the area. It was killing these salmon. So we've got those same issues here, but we just haven't had that study. I'll show you some data in a minute. The, there are potential human health effects as well. Um, so some of those chemicals, so obviously being a tire, so it's, it's got, uh, hydrocarbons attached to it. So these types of chemicals are known carcinogens 
And there's been a study done in the US, once again, where they've shown that there's a potential cancer cluster, if you like, attributed to goalies who are most more on the ground in those soccer games than a regular player. Um, there's a high incidence of cancer. Now, other studies have disputed that, and so the evidence is not clear, but there was a spike. So there's potential health effects for playing on it. So, you know, if you've got a... Being used on professional fields as well? Yes. Yeah, uh, FIFA um, has a, its guidelines on synthetic fields for FIFA. So, uh, but then, you know, playgrounds as well. You've got kids, you know, little kids, obviously, touching the surface, putting it to their mouth, that hand-to-mouth action is very common in little kids. And so potential exposure there, which we just don't know much about of that potential risk. But um, so there's dangers and obviously the microplastics as well. Uh, so uh, I did some studies. So this is a, uh, some photos here of some sports fields. And you can see here's a gate and all that little black specks. Uh, so this is uh, on the northern side of Sydney. All that is rubber crumb just, just sitting there and waiting to come up. So I had some students do some measurements of what's, what's immediately around the outside of these fields. Once you get off the field, onto the grass. And so they're seeing on playgrounds around 12,000 particles per square metre and on sports fields, double that 24,000. Most of it is small, once again, in that microplastic uh, range. And uh, there was evidence of it out to four and eight metres uh, past the sides as well. So this is something that I, I've spoken to Kim and Adrian about, and we've got some samples here, and they'll talk about that. Uh, that we are looking to do here locally to document. So the more data, the more information we have, the more we can talk to the regulators, to council, um, to do something about it. So obviously, yeah, and stop it, either coming off or change the surface of the bed. All right, and this is, I ran some toxicity tests with the leachate. So what I did is took some of that rubber crumb, and just shook it in a bottle, like on a rotating stirrer for uh, about a day. And then I took that water and I ran tests with some native critters. So this is kind of the first data on this for Australia. Uh, so we've got some mussel. So these are mussel larvae. So uh, just the, the blue mussel. Uh, we've got data from uh, can't see, but that's the uh, uh, little freshwater crustacean, like a planktonic crustacean. And then this is sea urchin larvae. So two marine species and one freshwater species. And what you're seeing, the bars, this is the, each bar represents a concentration of the leachate, right? And uh, basically you've got uh, survival. So if up the top here, you want it to be close to 100% survival. So zero is controls, right? So normal water. And what we're seeing is we started off running 100%, just took the straight water, the leachate water, and exposed animals, died within hours. Diluted it to 50%, right, by half, still died. And anyway, what we're getting down to here is we had to dilute it down to about 3% for, for most species or 1% before we weren't getting effects. So we had to dilute it down, you know, 99%, if you like, of its original makeup with just normal water before we weren't getting a response. So in other words, what that's telling us is it's super toxic to our aquatic animals. 
Um, we're doing some other tests on more longer term exposures. So this was done over 72 hours, so three, three day exposures. Uh, but we're doing more chronic level exposures to see what that effect might be. So it tells us it's if it, you know, even just the water coming from these fields is likely to be killing, you know, the reason why you probably don't have well, one of the reasons, not just for this, it, the, we don't have an oyster industry in the Georges River anymore is because of all the chemicals coming into that system over time. Obviously, this is a new issue, but this is you know, an example. Oh, yeah, there's exactly so there's definitely flow on effects. So, if you if you're losing a certain part of the food chain or that ecosystem, then there's major ramifications for that whole system, it, the system changes. So, um, yeah, that's yeah it's 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 sometimes hard so the question was about fish kills in, in the georges river after flooding sometimes it's hard to attribute a direct cause mm -hmm. um you can do analysis of the tissues and, and find mm -hmm. what's high mm -hmm. but it doesn't necessarily it'll tell you that it's been high but was it high before they died you know in, in the animal or was it because of the pulse that worked so you you can do some studies but it's it doesn't yeah correct that's right that's right and they're near to waterways so they're readily going to wash off into them so that that's the issue with the sports fields sorry so let's get on to some more positive things to finish off with all right sorry i'm going to finish up quickly uh so what can you guys do to help obviously we i don't know if you remember back in the day there was used to be three r's and then there's five r's now there's actually nine r's of things we can do <laughs> so things and we probably shouldn't refer to it as waste. It's really a resource, right? So we, we call it waste. We're the only species that are actually wasteful, you know? So, you know, there's a whole lot of things before recycling should be at the bottom of our list. We're, we, we're told and sold this idea that, oh, recycle this, recycle that. And recycling's good, but it's, there's a whole lot of things we should do before we get to recycling because recycling is costly and it's not the answer for everything. So there's a whole lot of the R's there, which you can read that I urge you to, you know, consider just, and the, the first one there, just rethinking is about your choice of product. You know, we have a lot of choice in the market now for different products for the same product by different manufacturers. So um, there's choices out there. And now we're going into these bioplastics. So you'll find the growth in bioplastics, which are naturally produced um, plastics. So made from plant materials or algae and seaweed materials. Um, so these are biodegradable. So our synthetic plastics are not biodegradable in a very long way. So there's lots of choices there, I think now. Yeah. And so these are just some of the alternative products uh, we can find for different things. But I just like this site, the, the web address down the bottom, I'm plastic free, is it's a good site because it actually tells you it's not trying to sell you anything, all it's giving you is the locations where you can chase up potential alternatives to plastics. Um, so have a think about that as well. 
of course, you know, it's also about action and, you know, getting change happening in your local communities really starts with people like yourself. Those grassroots roots movements are important. And, you know, for getting that change, you know, you need to lobby, you need to talk to your local council and, and just, or your local member mm. and, and tell them about the issue or what your concerns are. And the more people that do that, then that ultimately will lead to some change, hopefully. Obviously, you're already in a community group, but working together collectively is, is important to, to get that change happening faster. Uh, so with OFF, you know, you guys can collectively speak as one um, and can collect data and information yourselves. And so uh, Kim or Adrian will talk to you um, when I finish in a minute about how you can get involved with helping us collect some of that data uh, for the local area. And of course, you know, you can always, as I said before, get involved with OzMap as well outside of that. So I shall leave it there and say thank you for listening. It's apologies for rambling on. Uh, so I'm oh, yeah, happy, happy to take any questions both online and, and um, if you could Sorry. speak loudly, Hi. Julian. Thanks. Following up from yeah, that washing machine that we were talking about, right? We, we put our filters on. Yep. All right, and it's collecting stuff. It's not going into the water. What do we do with <laughs> this? Do we burn? Do we fill the land? I mean, or do we put it in another bin? I mean, that's a good question. So the question was, what do we do with the microplastics either collected from the washing machine or what we collect maybe from you know, our sampling, what do we do with it? So at the moment, I mean, it's a quantity thing. So there's, there are people that are collecting uh, marine debris, so the, the ocean rubbish and are making products out of that. So at the moment, there's nowhere to, to take those small bits. But I, I imagine going forward, if the washing machine manufacturers are pro all producing these filters, then they may also have a collection point. Uh, at the moment, all I'm going to say is you're going to have to put it in the bin. Don't burn it because that's going to release landfill. Yeah, I know. It's there's no there's no immediate solution at present. Sorry. Yep, another question from the floor. Yeah, so the guy is in the ocean. Yep. If they're naturally collecting this new dairy, is it at all feasible? have ships that are like giant trawlers yes. out there constantly you know gathering it dragging it in and then maybe some of the villages of the world could sponsor a ship in each or <clears throat> each guy and yeah. then again we still have to do something with it. Yeah that's right. But so it would be good to get it out of the ocean. Yeah. There, there already is so yeah. there's a project uh, I think it's called the ocean cleanup project um, and they've literally raised millions of dollars um, to clean up uh, some of the, the North Pacific garbage patch. It's been difficult. They haven't been too successful. They, they've tried to create a large boom, like kilometer long boom, but it keeps on breaking because the weather's obviously needs to be calm for it to work. Um, so, but yes, because there's a lot of it there, you can you can take it back to shore and you can reuse it. So there are companies making stuff from from that collected marine debris, but it's not a, a long term solution because it's just going to still you got to stop at the source, or else you're going to you're just going to be keep spending money on, on that kind of patch. Adrian, uh, so can you comment? Uh, uh, can we come up here and speak? Uh, Scott, can you just comment about synthetic field usage and grass field usage? Uh, I think you mentioned to us before that well managed grass fields actually give you similar usage to synthetic fields. Yes, that's right. So, <clears throat> unfortunately, the synthetic sports field industry has been in the ear of the decision makers, the, the local governments and, and state governments, 
and sold the idea that you can <clears throat> get triple the amount of play time on a synthetic sports field. But if you talk to the, the, the turf, natural turf people, they say that if it's well maintained and the soil, because what makes a, a grass last is actually the soil underneath. If the soil condition is initially you know, prepared right, then the life of that field will last longer than a you know, maybe less prepared field. And so they, they, the numbers they keep bandied about is uh, the, the playing hours on a field. And they say for a, a, a natural field, it's something like 20 hours of collective playtime is yeah. kind of the limit before it starts degrading and just turns to dirt. What these the natural turf guys have shown, and they've done there's an exa working example in um, Mossman Council. So the council paid this, them to prepare it correctly. And they've been getting something like 36 to 40 hours of playtime on the natural grass field, so double. Conversely, the synthetic turf guys who are saying, well, we can get 60 plus hours, they're getting nothing like that because of the heat issues, um, uh, the heat issues mainly, and, and it's even in winter, as I mentioned, the temperatures are high. So that the playing times on the synthetic sports field are coming down to that 40 hour mark now. Anyway, so they're almost equivalent if you use the right. Okay. Um, the soccer club, I don't know if anyone's a member of the soccer club here or online, uh, the soccer clubs, seem to be liking it because they sold the idea that it's more playtime. I, the players, I, yeah, the players are mixed. Some totally don't want to play on it. Others don't mind it. So, from what I think. Um, my question is about how long it lasts too, because if we yes. go down to the synthetic field of Kirawee, yes. which has been there, what, four or five years? <clears throat> I noticed recently it had to replace big patches on it. Yeah. And the next question is, what happens to that old turf yes. when they take it that, away? Where does it go? That's a great question. So the life that they say the life of these fields is about 10 years, but you're right. It's 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 probably less than that. Mm. Depends on how it's maintained. Every year you have to, because it's the rubber crumb, you're losing it. They're, they're losing a large amount of it each year. So they one, they have to replace the rubber each year to maintain it. But then the overall life of the field, they're replacing in five years, five to eight years, I've heard. They have to scatter the rubber from Correct. Over the whole field. They got a big like bulldozer-y yeah. thing. Got a machine that does it. Got yeah. to the rubber Every year, yeah. To, to make it playable because you want to create that soil like surface and to keep the grass blades upright you need that soil like surface in. yeah they did and some have have gone back to sand and the alternative now some fields are being they're using cork instead of the rubber so, <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, could just, just a uh, minute, David. I'm going to hand over to the Zoomers oh, yes. out there and give them the opportunity to ask one a question. Uh, we've got Sonia on the line. Could you unmute yourself, Sonia, and go ahead? Hi. Um. Thank you. I've really enjoyed the presentation. Um, just on the synthetic fields, as a tennis player, we've been playing on these synthetic grass fields for, oh, I think decades, but yeah. they don't have a rubber, rubber crumb. They have sand in there, which I would think would be better. Why can't they do that with the soccer fields? Uh, I think it's a good question, Sonia. Thanks for that. Um, I think it's because... The, the sand doesn't provide as good a, a playing surface. So as I mentioned, FIFA uh, has certain standards 
I mean, not obviously all fields of FIFA accredited, but um, I think because of that, they've gone with the rubber crumb or, or the cork now, because it just uh, creates a more realistic playing surface, is what I'm told. Can, can, I, can I just make one observation, please? There's Not. just a um, an advertising campaign on TV at the moment by the government, and it seems they're patting themselves on the back with all those fabulous things they're making from our soft plastic bags. Yes, I see. And the, it actually sounds like they'd like more soft plastic bags because they can do so many wonderful things with them, including fence posts and whatever. Surely yeah. there, there should be something about decreasing the use of plastics, not sort of encouraging people to create more. Yes, I mean, that's uh, it's a good comment. Um, I, I, I think they're, I'm not going to call it a beat up, but it's definitely a marketing exercise. Um, I know, and while that's a great use of the soft plastics, and I urge people to continue to use those recycling means through your supermarkets for soft plastics, I know the markets, so the, the, the products are not, there's not enough market for those products at, as it currently stands. Mm -hmm. So while they're creating posts and uh, whatever the benches and tables, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, you know, all that is great. There's only a limited number of those you can create, and there's there's more plastics, soft plastics, than products that can be made at this stage. So I wouldn't urge people to create more soft plastics just because of that point. But yeah, that was good. Yeah, that's a valid question. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Anyone else on I'm Zoom? Ask a question. Oh, Anybody on Zoom there? No. No. All right. Thank you. Is, is there a, uh, oh, can we give oh, Matt a go? Uh, Susan, thanks. Uh, just a most of it's got to be quiet. Speak up a bit, Matt. So we're using fungi, That's better. fungi or worms or something. Yeah. That eat the plastic. Is that just use better plastic or is uh, it changed? No, that's a good question. So the question was about uh, natural con consumption of plastic from different species. So there's uh, fungi, bacteria, there's mealworms. Uh, I did actually experiment with uh, yeah, mealworms, they're little, actually beetle larvae, um, uh, with foam. They apparently eat uh, styrofoam, expanded foam. And so I ran an experiment with just feeding them different types and, and amounts of foam. And it does work. It's just really slow. You need lots uh, to, to, to do it. And, and so what they do, they actually digest it. So they, they've got uh enzymes within their body that will digest does it give them nutrition or they have to supplement um they will you'll need to be supplemented in the long term yes what's the byproduct? sorry what's the byproduct the byproduct is just feces yeah yeah so in the feces it's it's organic yes yeah it's actually digest they convert it so they get energy from it, and the same with the bacteria. Yeah, people are. Yeah, people are doing that, but it's just the scale, the amount of plastic we have to to treat that is. It's we're not at that. It's at really the experimental level. Maybe you know, in, in a few decades' time or a decades' time, we might get to that. But it, as it currently stands, just the volumes of plastic we can't. You'd have to treat it in in the right environment. Okay, it's a fascinating topic. Yes. Um, well, I think it is personally. It is. <laughs> it is. I agree. I think we all agree. So you've seen the interest in the in yes. the uh, in the topic through the audience tonight. 
Uh, it's fabulous. Um, so I'd like to call on um, Adrian now to. Uh, uh, Scott, uh, this, is a, this is the second time I've heard you speak, and I'm okay. equally as fascinated. Can I have a hear? So yeah, yeah uh, I'm equally as fascinated the second time because um, I'm learning more and more, and, and and I'm getting shocked even more and more when you told me about uh, the nanoplastics, which um, you're keeping under your under your, under your, you know keeping it secret at the moment. <laughs> it worries me greatly, but uh, nevertheless, we've got a lot of work to do. Um, I have seen the north coast of New Guinea two three years ago, two years ago absolutely shocked that you know we think we've got a problem here but the north coast of new guinea is just getting piles and piles and piles of plastics coming down from asia and from new guinea itself so we've got a lot of work to do here but even in other parts of the world so good luck with your earth watch institute uh, we wish you very well and look forward to hearing back from you at some stage meanwhile a little bit of plastic but we've got two plants um, um i Graham, I don't know what species we're giving away today. Is it Cassinia? Yeah. Oh, very good. And mm -hmm. oh, 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 right. So anyway, a lucky draw prize for you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very well, thank much. You. Thank you, everyone. Away to you. So you're free to unplug and uh, leave the meeting. Uh,